We from Disputed History decided to take matters into our own hands and dive into the book the Masters of the Air series will be based on to give you a rough sketch of what you can expect when the series finally becomes available on Apple TV. We will do this in the form of a multi-part documentary. If you missed part one, you should definitely check that out first. In that video, we address the strategy and the philosophy of the Mighty Eight. Please don't forget to like our video and subscribe to the channel. Doing so will enable us to keep producing regular and high quality videos. In part two, we will go into detail about the first involvement of the inexperienced Mighty Eight in their first real clash with the Luftwaffe in the highly contested skies above mainland Europe. When the first bomber crews and B-17s of the American Army Air Corps arrived in England, the pressure to act was mounting. This was a direct consequence of the fact that Allies suffered some major defeats in mainland Europe and Africa, and it seemed that for a moment that the war could be lost. America had to act, and the only way in the early years of the war was to bomb German targets. Besides this, the independence of the American bombers was also on the line. The RAF, who had already been fighting with the Luftwaffe since 1940, suggested the bombers should join them in their effective night raids. The Chief of the Air Corps, Henry Arnold, acted immediately and threw the ill-prepared rookies of the 8th into the fight. We didn't quite know how we were going to make it work at first. All we knew is that we would make it work, he later said about the first bomb runs. The first real brawl of the American Army Air Corps took place on October 9th of the year 1942. That morning, amidst the briefing for a raid, a pilot asked if they could expect anti-aircraft fire. The briefing officer replied, Well, there weren't any when I was there in the First World War. Later that day, 108 heavy bombers took off from the English airfields with 400 fighter planes to protect them on their way to Lille, where the steel was manufactured for the German army. The Luftwaffe awaited the Mighty Eight and a ferocious air battle broke out. fleet eventually touched down in England, four bombers and their crews were lost, and 46 planes were severely damaged but still managed to land on hastily built airstrips in southeast England. The bomber crews of the B-17s and their escort fighters reported that they shot down a staggering 102 enemy fighters, a major victory over the German air fleet. But, and there's always a but, the reports from the Nazis painted another picture. They summarized that only two planes were downed, and above all, they never had 102 fighter planes available when the bombers reached France. The inexperienced and poorly trained gunners of the B-17s were trigger happy at that stage of the war. With shrapnel of anti-aircraft fire penetrating the fuselage, bullets of the Messerschmitt ricocheted in the hull and soaring right between the bomber formation, the gunners sprayed their machine gun fire all over the sky hitting their escort and other bomber planes, and occasionally the enemy. The B-17 gunners never wanted to give false information, but the fog of war had clouded their judgment. A gunner from a B-17 later summarized it as follows. We were living in a fool's paradise. The bombers of the Air Corps experienced difficulties as well. Entering the ground to airspeed, the wind rift and the bombs fall time into the northern bomb site while under extreme pressure from the enemy gunfire proved quite difficult. To top it all off, the pilot had to level the plane, but the enemy anti-aircraft fire forced most of them to make evasive movements, which tilted the northern bombsite gyroscopes. As a result, almost every bomb missed the target by several miles. The overall commander of the bombing missions, Eker, didn't mention the difficulties his bomber crews faced in his reports which he sent to Henry Hep Arnold. He even wrote the following, the Lille mission proved conclusively that bombers in strong formations can be employed effectively and successfully without fighter support. In hindsight, Eker was right, but not in the way that he envisioned. The creation of daylight bombing, in conjunction with the British night campaign, would over time dangerously overstretch the German air defense. But in 1942, both the German and the Allied High Command saw the early bombing campaign as pathetically ineffective. This was part two of our documentary. We hope you'll stick around for part three, where we will address the workhorse of the Mighty Eight, the B-17, and the dangers the bomber crews faced. If you like this video, we think you may also like our video on the alternate history of Europe. Check it out if you have some time to spare. And don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss our next upload. And as always, see you next time.